Grandma used to pray, oh Lord, please save them from the evil snares and all the dangers that entangle. Yeah, though they walk in through the valley of the shadows, just prepare and make them fit for every battle because but I know they're bound to come and I know they're bound to fall. But in your bounty, Lord, preserve their beautiful home. Right. We still survive and offer grandma's prayers. Surrounded by the jungle and the lion's den. Tread light, cause these traps is inconspicuous. They hide right in plain sight. Thinking we don't see them when they linger. Look right beneath the surface. Then leave a trail of corpses. Crisis, prices, your life a disposable commodity. Like living in a fantasy condition to believe that the system even cares whether selling CDs or walking or driving a read. Look, they don't even need a reason. It's just your breathing and being black. When it's such a pretty fall, a pretty fall It don't seem like we falling at all, at all It's just a GMO dream Where things are never really what they seem Please, kill the violins Tell them just to play me something pretty Cause this pretty city got me screaming bloody murder So they got me screaming This pretty city got me Got me on song, look, get your hand up on my pocket, distraction, so lazy they use the same tactics, like kind them with some trinkets, just don't let them get to thinking, that light bulb gets a blinking, you know niggas and ideas, oh dear, my dear, my dear, you may not know me, but I know you very well, for sight, for sight, they say hindsight is 2020, well tell me something, we gotta see that history is on repeat, and maybe it takes a beat and a melody to speak a little louder than the message in the clouds, or the essence in the air i swear my god is just so clear that a system driven by fear can never give us nothing but more of the same things things oh when it's such a pretty fall a pretty fall it don't seem like we've fallen at all it's just a gmo dream where things are never really what they seem please cue the violins tell them just to play me something pretty because this gritty city got me screaming it's murder Got me screaming, got me. This pretty city got me, got me on song. It's time to good people. Welcome to RSTV. We're in the building, you know what I mean? And we are ready for revolution. Um, haven't seen y'all in a while. You haven't seen me in a while, but we figured it's about that time. Uh, we have a whole lot going on on the planet, you know, and we want to make sure that we are in tune with with Africans globally. We want to make sure that uh, we are gearing towards winning and we have our uh, politics in order uh, because we know politi- political education is job one. We want to make sure that we're healthy because health is wealth. We want to make sure that we're strong because if we consider ourselves warriors or fighters or revolutionaries, whatever it is you consider yourself, you have to be on top. You know, so that's what it's all about. Again, I welcome you all to Black Power Media. If it's your first time checking this out, make sure that you subscribe to the channel, subscribe to the platform. Um, we're always looking to have new comrades, allies, uh, supporters, and and even a few haters don't hurt. You know what I'm saying? It keeps us on our toes. But um, indeed, we are grateful to be here. Um, today, I, I wanted to bring in a, a guest because I think that one of the um, things that have been on the table for such a long time has been um, class struggle. You know what I'm saying? And and I think that it's always uh, discussions around race. It's always discussions around class. So I wanted to uh, invite a brother on who I've known um, in passing for quite a while. And, and you know, I found that we have a whole lot of things in common. So, you know, I, I can appreciate uh, his analysis. This particular brother uh, is originally from New York, uh, Queens, I believe, you know, uh, that 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 beautiful borough shout out to queens um and you know he's been a um, a writer journalist so on and so forth he's the co-host of this is revolution podcast he's a longtime contributor uh to black agenda report his work can be found uh, various places online including you know 
uh, Newsweek and, you know, I know he's no stranger to this particular platform. So um, right after these messages, we'll be back with Pascal Robert. So y'all stay tuned. Let your folks know we're here. Um, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button and stick around. You're on Black Power Media. This is what we do around here. Peace. What's going on, my man Pascal? What's good? Hey, man. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings to Brother Kalanji. Peace and greetings to the chat and everyone else, man. I really appreciate the opportunity to be on your program. And shout out to the rest of the Black Power Media team. No doubt. It's my pleasure. It's our pleasure. Um, you got excuse the uh the technical joints. My uh producer is not present today, so I'm doing this one man gang with, you know, uh, so you know, I'm trying to make it look like something. So definitely appreciate your patience, brother. I appreciate that, man. I thank you for having me, man. No doubt, no doubt. For folks who are unfamiliar, I know I gave a uh, a brief, uh, a bridge version of, of of who you are. Um, if you don't mind, give us a little uh, a, a deeper um, insight or dive into, you know, who is Pascal Robert and and you know what what was your upbringing and 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 you know. No problem. I, you know, I definitely do that. I grew up in uh, Jamaica, Queens, New York. Uh, I'm, you know, pretty much a, a child of the '60s, if you will. I was born towards the late '60s, so you know, I, you know, we, you and I, are approximate in age. Uh, for many people who follow my work, they know that my main areas of uh, writing revolve, revolve around two subjects black politics, black political history, and Haitian politics and Haitian history. My parents uh, left uh, the, the nation of Haiti in the 60s under the Papa Doc regime and came to the United States. And uh, pretty much uh, my worldview and my understanding of my identity comes from the fact that I was surrounded very early on in my household, on my paternal family side, on my father's family side, with many, many black revolutionaries and radicals, largely because my father had two brothers, one older, one younger, who had left Haiti to go study in the Soviet Union as uh, Marxist-Leninists. So they were radical revolutionary communists. And my paternal family had a long family lineage of supporting very radical uh, black, uh, black nationalists and, uh, and very radical black political activity in Haiti. You know, my, my father, you know, was a, you know, my father was a blue collar guy. He was an auto mechanic, but he came from a very uh, upper middle class kind of Haitian family. And contrary to the notion that people have that, you know, it's only the light skinned people in Haiti that are elite because Haiti is a country that has a very, very, very complex class stratification that goes back to the Haitian revolution. And I've talked about this several times when I talk about the revolution is that one, people have to understand that, that basically the Haitian revolution created a, a kind of a tripartite system of class within the blacks on the island. You had the uh, the super majority of blacks at the, con the the beginning of the revolution in 1791 were the Bosal, which is a pejorative for those who were born in Africa. So in 1791, when the Haitian Revolution begins, George Washington is president of the United States. Over 65 percent of the black people on the island were born in Africa. So that means these are people who were born free and came to the country. 
These right. are what were pejoratively known as the Bosal. Then you had the Creole Blacks. Creole Blacks who were Blacks who were born on the island. They were more acculturated to French language. They were more acculturated to the to the accoutrement of French society. Some of them had been free. Some of them owned slaves. Then you had what we sadly call mulattoes or mixed race blacks or the mulatto elite. Many of them owned, sla uh, owned slaves. They were free as well. And between the, the Afranchi, which is the Creole blacks and the mulattoes, they owned 25% of the Bosal black slaves. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what you have to understand is that this kind of paradigm creates massive internal class conflict amongst black people. So we're not even talking about white people yet. So the, inter the interesting dichotomy in how this influences my politics as a Haitian is that my, my family, both paternally and maternally, represent two combating elites who both actually were somewhat oppressors of the Bosal Africans. But one side of my family could use the charade of Black unity to maintain or use that to connect with those Bosal Africans, while the other side, because of their fair complexion, would not able to do so. My father's family were basically descended from Creole black generals who fought in the Haitian Revolution. So my father's family had had land for a long time. They were what you would call gondon. The gondon class in Haiti are basically black upper middle class people who can trace their family going back to the revolution, who as a result of the revolution owned land. They had servants. They had people working in their house. They had Rastavec peasants in the house, just like the light skinned people did. And they were more the planter class. In other words, they made their wealth by owning plantations and having peasant farmers on their land. So my father's family has deeds of land in Haiti going back over 200 years. My mm -hmm. maternal family come from the more light-skinned, fair complexion mulatto elite. My mother's family had doctors going back to their family, going to the uh, you know, 1960 to the 1800s. My great grandfather on my mother's side was an Anglican bishop in the Episcopal Church in Haiti. So, both sides of my family, they were not the bourgeoisie, they were not the owners of the means of production in Haiti, but compared to the supermajority of the Bolsar Black, they were living pretty well off. And historically, their families had lives well off. But what is interesting is that when they come to the United States, they're dealing with, in the 60s, they're dealing with white racism in New York. And my father, as a blue-collar tradesman, was a car mechanic, and he, eventually he owned his own kind of repair shops. My mom was a registered nurse. They really were only living in a kind of a working-class, middle-class kind of life. We lived in Cambria Heights. It was a nice neighborhood, but it was a kind of a middle-class neighborhood. So I never grew up with this kind of like Cosby-esque notion of I'm the heir to some kind of black Haitian royalty vibe at all, because there were many Haitians from the generation of my parents' era that came from Haiti to the United States who were really from that same class. But they never really talked about those kind of dynamics when we were growing up because they were amongst kind of people in their own, in their own class environment growing up in Queens. But what is interesting, though, even growing up in New York, in the 70s, in the 80s, there was a class division amongst Haitian in New York. There was this phenomenon about Haitians who live in Queens, in Long Island, and Haitians who live in Brooklyn. The Haitians who lived in Brooklyn would have been considered the descendants of those Bosal, you know, poorer Haitians, who, by the way, are the Haitians that traditionally are the supermajority of the poor, oppressed class of Haitians that you see in Haiti today, who did not really reap the material benefits of the Haitian Revolution for a variety of reasons we can go to another time. But there was a kind of class tension and the stigmatization between the Queens and Long Island Haitians, some who were black and some who were fair complexion or mulatto, and the you know, Haitians who lived in Brooklyn. So I say all this to tell you that contrary to the notion that my politics is influenced around class from some kind of Marxian or Marxoid uh, obsession, 
It's totally the opposite. My understanding of the way in which class affects the politics and the politics of black liberation is a direct consequence of witnessing the battle between class and color in my own family and watching my mother's side of the family and my father's side of the family intertwine in battle each other. Because even though my father's family comes from these black gondon, my father's family were what you would call a more radical version of the, you know, they were, they, they, they supported land redistribution. They always, they, they always were, my grandmother was always about empowering the poorer class. So that really was, a they were a much more kind of revolutionary component of that class. You could call them almost class traders, if you will, to their class. They were not really about exploiting the pleasant, the present class. My mother's class, I'll be very frank, they were actually kind of radical themselves. My mother was never one to look down on people because of where they came from. That was not part of the way she was raised. But their sense of radicalism came from their religious uh, obligation. Because my great-grandfather was an Episcopal bishop, they had this sense of a kind of revolutionary Christianity where you do right by poor people, you treat them right, you don't treat them bad, you know, you don't treat them badly. So neither my mother or my dad had this kind of like, oh, we look down on other people uh, who are Haitian kind of worldview, but they did come from, there were people in, particularly in my mom's family who, were, who didn't really grow up in my household, who I would see who had the very kind of snobbish, colorist kind of politics that I was always very turned off to early on in my childhood that really, 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 um, affected the way I I I I I uh I shaped my politics. So you know you know I went to Catholic school in New York like many you know Caribbean kids do. I ended up going to college, law school, practiced law for a while. Uh uh and uh I started writing for uh I started blogging in 2007 and eventually ended up writing for Black and Gender Report around the time of the Obama presidency. I became close with Bruce Dixon Early on, he became like a mentor to me, and I spent like 10, 12 years writing for Black Agenda Report, uh, allhiphop.com, Huffington Post, you know, a variety of different news sites, a variety of different locations. And uh, eventually, you know, some of my work has been sponsored on, on Newsweek now. And about two or so years ago, I connected uh, through, uh, you know, one of a good friend of our show, Tore Reed, with Jason Miles, because I had been, for years, I, people had told me, you got to start a podcast, you got to start a podcast. I wasn't really good at the technical aspect of how to do that, but, uh, you know, Tore was like, yo, you got to talk to this brother, Jason Miles, he's a cool brother, and we did one episode, where, and people still love that episode, where we talked about who speaks for Black people in terms of the history of Black media post-Black post power and post-civil rights and how that comes to the facilitation where we have the rise of someone like Charlemagne the God being a spokesman for Black politics. And uh, people liked it so much that we decided to come together and basically take his already existing podcast, which is This Is Revolution podcast, and make it a two-man team that eventually became like a four man, a four man and one woman team that is still expanding, and that started us on what is now this is revolutionary podcast. This is revolution podcast. We've been doing this for you know almost three years now. You know we had we did four episodes for the Real News Network. We've been on a variety of other podcasts. We've done some live shows, and we've expanded up pretty effectively. And you know you know hum the law. We're doing we're doing pretty good right now. So that's kind of where we are at this current moment in the media sphere. Hey man, you know that that's a um, a a um, awesome story for a lack of better words, you know, because you <laughs> touched on on so many things. But what I'm gonna do before we like hop all the way in, um, you just sparked my interest with with you saying that that first show, uh, who speaks for black media? I mean, who speaks for black people in regards to media? Um, I, I like the answer to that. I didn't see that show, so for for our listeners and our viewers and whatnot, who does speak for black people here in america who do you feel well sadly whoever the ruling class chooses speaks for you know black. first of all i would make the argument this might be controversial for some people watch the show is that there are no there is no one black community there are black communities 
Hmm. There are various black communities, but the notion that 42 million black people, which is larger than the population of Canada, are one collective community that all symbiotically have the same political aspirations and ideas is part of the problem because it facilitates a phenomenon that I call the politics of containment. What does that mean? If you say that 42 million black people are one community, and we understand that the actual power structure is controlled by capital and capitalism that is not largely controlled by blacks, then you realize that the people who are negotiating on behalf of that community are largely going to be successful, some largely going to be picked by the ruling class. And what that also means is that the ruling class will make sure that those people reflect the worldview and the agenda of the ruling class, not the agenda of those 42 million black people. And one of the consequences of the politics of containment is you end up having what we've had in black American politics since the rise of Booker T. Washington is brokers of black politics. You have a cartel controlling, you know, basically this, this containment who act as intermediary, intermediaries, facilitators, or compradors, or collaborators, or racial ventriloquists on behalf of black people, usually in exchange for either some kind of patronage from the ruling class or some kind of economic stake. And by the way, this has been done by both black nationalists and integrationists. This has been done by all types of black political ideologues in the black community that always sets up this kind of Bookerite containment politics that denies the capacity of Black people to realize that they have internal class stratification amongst themselves and saying that a Black person who works the French fry drawer at McDonald's has something politically in common with the manager who owns 15 different McDonald's stores that is, is over him and owns those stores is politically ridiculous because that manager doesn't want him to have a union, doesn't want him to get health care, doesn't want him to be able to get $15 an hour. Yet because the, both of them are black, they everyone is going to tell them that they should have the same politics. I think that that worldview, which black people sadly have had not only in America, but in many other places, is the main reason why black politics always is, has, and will be a failure until we collapse that whole politics of containment. No, so that, that, that's wild that you say that because really uh, I would add, and, and my argument would be that, you know, most black folks don't know what a community is. So when you talk about uh, a black community, you know what I'm saying? It, it's like, you know, I agree. What black community? You know what I'm saying? When you say communities, to a great extent, the majority of the folks that we see don't even know how to practice community. They don't even know who their neighbors are. So Correct. if you live in a space where the first thing you don't even know who's around you, that's problematic in and of itself. So when we talk about even being organizers, because folks talk about, you know, organizing in this community, organizing that community. If you don't know who's to the right of you or to the left of you, if shit goes down, you have potential enemies. You understand what I'm saying? You have potential uh, uh, robbers or, 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 or murderers or whatever because of the fact that Again, it is every man for himself. So you can't talk about building internationally or nationally or even locally if you can't organize what's on your block. And that's part of the problem. We we really take it to a whole nother level. And to a great extent, we see a whole it gives rise to these ambulance chasers who who swoop down and say, listen, well, you know, such and such got shot. And and really they just utilize these uh, uh, quote unquote tragedies to be vultures on the black community. It's like, okay, you see, you know, these bodies out here, let's go pick that apart and let's get a name for ourselves. Um, I want to, want to touch on something because you, uh, you often mention class, right? Um, and, and one of the things that, that uh, I pride myself on here at RSTV on black power media is uh, reaching folks who may not have the same politics. You know, you have folk, a lot of folks who are apolitical that might come on because they might have saw something in the streets or whatever the case is. So what I would like you to do for folks who are, because we take for granted that because we do what we do and we speak to people that we speak to, that everyone is clear about the terms and the terminology, right? So I want to, if, if, uh, if you don't mind, define class war class war is a concept that basically acknowledges the fact that 
in social social spaces, there are material hierarchies. What does that mean? There are people who have economic interests in societies that are rooted in hierarchy. Landowners, laborers, factory workers, plantation workers, the politics and the worldview or the interests of people in those social spaces will largely be dictated by what their material role is in that society. The landowners and the owners of the factories are interested in maintaining their profit margin. So they want to make sure that the labor, the people who are the laborers get low wages. They don't get, they don't unionize. The people who work on the plantations have to be able to work a certain amount of hours to maintain a certain amount of uh, productivity and profit margin. The people who work on the plantations may have a problem with the people who are working inside the factories because they have better conditions. They have air conditioning and they don't have air conditioning and they don't have access to certain types of, they don't have good drinking water. So there are going to be conflicts in a social space when these material hierarchies exist. The notion of class warfare is the concept that those who have the least in terms of ownership of the means of production. What do means of production mean? Means of production are the actual mechanisms of business, economy, and profit-making institutions, whether it be from oil rigs to, 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 to sugarcane mills, to, to IBM, to tech industries, to textile mills. The, the, the profit-generating, revenue-generating industries in a society the people who are the owners of those means of production, a fancy word for those people are the bourgeoisie. Those people's interests are to extract as much profit and revenue from society. The people who generally, who are not the owner of the means of production will be generally of two or three other classes. There will be the laborers who work for them, who people call the proletariat, they work for those people who are the bourgeoisie, and they are the people that the bourgeoisie wants to make sure that they can keep their wages low. They can extract more profit from their value of their labor. They can actually make more profit for them. They want to deny them health care because it costs the bourgeoisie money. They want to deny them the ability to get overtime because it costs the bourgeoisie money. So the laborer has to work to maintain the ability to provide profit for that, the, the owners of the means of production, the bourgeoisie. Then you have what we call the lumpen proletariat. What is the lumpen proletariat? The lumpen proletariat are the people who are so poor that they don't even have the capacity to work to make profit for the bourgeoisie. That they are, you know, some of them turn to crime, they become vag vagabonds, they become homeless, they become a variety of things. That's what you would call the underclass, the lumpen, the lumpen proletariat, right? Then you have another class of individuals, which you would call the petite bourgeoisie. What is the petite bourgeoisie? Or some would call the professional managerial class. The petite bourgeoisie are what you would call professionals who don't necessarily own the means of production, but they are such, they are such managers. They are the managerial class of the business interests that their revenue stream as labor is so high that they identify with the owners of the means of production. And they are usually and almost always the class because they, they, they're always worried because they, they don't want to, sometimes they used to be the proletariat and they don't want to be that anymore. They're not the, the bourgeoisie yet. They're not the owners of the means either. So they are a very reactionary class. What does that mean? They are always trying to act in a way to be retrograde or regressive politically to keep the system intact. In and they oftentimes are the ones who are the most willing to, to enforce retribution against the labor class, the proletariat, and the lumping class or the underclass. Class warfare is the argument that the various classes in a social ecosystem that are most oppressed will only achieve liberation if they engage in actual warfare 
against those who are at the highest point of that pyramid or those who ideologically and intellectually identify with those at the highest point of that pyramid. And as long as that warfare is not done, regardless of the racial makeup or the ethnic makeup of the or of the actors, there will always be the majority of people who are at the bottom that will be exploited and have their, their labor and resources extracted. Okay, now, great. Few uh, questions playing uh, Cracker's Advocate. Can black folks, can Africans be a part of the bourgeoisie class? Because we're talking about owning means and production. We're talking about, you know, the resources, so on and so forth. When we see some of these um, uh, folks that are part of the capital class, they they don't they don't main they don't own or maintain that. They are entertainers for that. Um, example would be we look at these quote unquote billionaires. You know what I mean? We look at these white billionaires. We look at um, Bezos. We look at uh, 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 Elon Musk and all those other folks. There's 250 billion plus. Then we look at the Negroes, uh, the Robert uh, uh, Smiths and, and the Jay Z's right. and the Rihanna's. They're 10 billion under, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. 10 billion might be the top, 11 billion. So compared to these other billionaires, of course, they I argue that they are the um, uh, the black billionaires are the impoverished billionaires compared to those other folks. I wouldn't so, call them impoverished at all because a billionaire is a billionaire. I, I right. they're, they're still class enemies. I, I don't believe right. that race makes. The, I, I don't believe in that racial kinship nonsense. Nonsense at all. No, no, I, I get that, but would you would you say that they can be part of the bourgeoisie system, or we consider still consider them petty bourgeois? I wouldn't consider though. I would not consider someone like Robert Smith or Rob Johnson petty bourgeois. They are bourgeois. They own a means of production. They don't own, you know, IBM or or uh, Amazon. But owning BET or owning a securities company that makes you a billionaire means that you own some means of production. I, my position is this: is that I would say the capacity of uh, black people in the pre-civil rights era, before integration, to be the actual bourgeoisie in America was profoundly low. In other words, the ability of Black people to own the actual American means of production uh, in 1929 was profoundly low. However, you still would have small numbers of Blacks who can own land or businesses where they can still have labor, black labor or otherwise, where they can extract resources from them and own some means of production. The bourgeoisie doesn't necessarily have to own all of the means of production in the society, but do they own some of the means of production? But this is what I will make a concession to you. I will agree with you that the majority of the, the black quote unquote elite isn't even what you call, you know, impoverished bourgeoisie or chump change bourgeoisie, if you will. They are really black professional managerial class. They are petite bourgeoisie. Yes. They are professionals, lawyers, doctors, engineers who are just employees who have a higher revenue of, of, of profit that they receive from uh, their services where they identify as elites. But as I told you, the petite bourgeoisie is still oftentimes more reactionary to the bourgeoisie because he's more in a position of class precarity because he doesn't want to go back to live in, in the hood. And oftentimes his politics will be more reactionary and he'll be more willing to engage and indulge in policies like criminalizing people with sagging pants because they make black people look like, look bad. Or we got to double down on mass incarceration because these Negroes are messing up my hood with their with their with their loud boom boxes. In other words, oftentimes his racial allegiance to the black proletariat and lumpen proletariat makes him more reactionary and more antagonistic than the actual white bourgeoisie and petite bourgeoisie because he looks at the black lumpen and the black proletariat as a reflection of himself and he will hate them because he feels like that negro is stopping him from getting his fat back in biscuits yeah. and if there were few of them he would kick off fat back in biscuits 
Uh, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, <laughs> that, that is, that is absolutely, uh, that, that I, I'm sitting here just, um, it, it's always funny, no matter how many times we, 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 we deal with this and we, we, we talk about it and discuss it, so on and so forth, being in the, the so-called black Mecca and the new black Hollywood, you know, we, we, we see this all the time, you know, it's, it's the home of the petty bourgeois. You know what I'm saying? That that's the you know it's it's damn near I would argue the capital for black petty bourgeoisie, right? Um, yeah. I, I wanna um, you know, you previously stated that um, black and brown people need to engage in class warfare against black collaborators. Okay, yeah. so I want you to 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 again for the sake of terminology, um, define the black collaborator and why is it important for the black and brown um. Uh, here in the United States and abroad to engage in class warfare with these individuals or these groups? Not a problem. The black collaborator is the class of black people, usually, but not always, university pedigree, who is elevated through the system of traditional Western education and economic empowerment to a position of social control over the black poor and the black working class to ensure that the political agenda of the ruling class and the financial interests of the ruling class are secured by ensuring that the black poor and working class do not disturb the economic hierarchy and function of capitalism in any way. And they are compensated either directly with revenue through their labor and jobs or patronage, i.e. fat back and biscuits in exchange for that collaboration. So a collaborator doesn't necessarily have to be a civil rights organization. It doesn't necessarily have to be Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton or 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 the Congressional Black Caucus, even though they are collaborators. The black professional managerial class, the black petite bourgeoisie, black membership organizations, fraternities, sororities, the divine line, the links, the boule, um, uh, uh, Freemasons. All of these middle class black professional managerial class organizations that are designed to reify or reify is a fancy word to validate, to validate the existing hierarchies of capitalism as they are the best black beneficiaries of that system and to collaborate with the functionality of that system and corral the political aspiration of poor and working class black people into supporting the viability of that system, whether it be through the hip hop bourgeoisie and black capitalism that only benefits that class, or whether it's through, you know, buy and support blank banks that only benefits that class, or whether it's through, come on support sister Kamala we need you to support the Democratic Party that mass incarcerated you for 30 years that benefits that class through that patronage or through get out the vote campaigns that have been sports to you by the divine nine to make sure you vote for the parasitic black mayor of record who wants to make sure that your public schools are eviscerated with these scumbag charter schools and increases mass incarceration anyway. And is down with the hotel administration, down with the real estate, you know, financial interest in your city that bankrolled him and got him into the position of mayor. But black people think that he is now the new black power in the city because he is the man and they're happy. Shout out to Eric Adams. These are your black compradors. And these are your black collaborators, if you will. And these are the people that class warfare needs to be made against. Right on. Right on. So when you talk about class war, how do you 
envision uh, class warfare being brought about? Is I it mean, a, listen, you want to ask me? I mean, what my aspirational? I mean, hey, if, man, I, the, the, I, if, all, if I told you what my aspirational desire would be, <laughs> we would probably have this YouTube show plug. But in terms yeah. of real politics, you know what I'm saying? Unfortunately, we can't live in the world where, you know, brothers and sisters from the hood are mau mowing Negroes on Martha's Vineyard. You know, we understand that we're not at that level of actual political reality. But the larger point is that what would need to be done is that a politics, a confrontational politics. One, what would have to be done is there have to be a political education campaign. Yeah. A political education campaign that requires class traders or what Emil Cabral call those who engage in class suicide. What is a class trader? A class trader is a brother who is educated, like yourself or myself or like Jared, who basically realized that most of the Negroes that have his level of education are worthless collaborators who just want to get paid, who basically just want to see the system you know, perpetuate and don't want to challenge it who is willing to empower the, pro, the, the poor and working class black community with the information of how the system works to radicalize them to engage in class warfare. So number one, we've got to be able to find out who are the brothers and sisters willing to be class traders, traders to their class. When we get that cadre, we need to take that cadre and go into the hood where the black working class and the working poor are and the poor and give the political education to inform them of everything we just shared, how the system works, who are these, who are the collaborators, why this notion of racial kinship, we all in this together nonsense has got to stop. You know, how this, you know, why the politics as usual doesn't work and radicalize them to go into the political spaces where these collaborators work and disturb their enterprises, either through protest politics or physical dis disruption to, to call them out. Because I don't call them race traders because I don't ever believe they had allegiance based on race anyway. They're looking out for their pockets. Right. Yeah. Word. That's so, how I would envision manifesting class warfare. No doubt, no doubt. So, so for clarity, class warfare. Uh, you know, I heard you say that it, it doesn't have to be violent. No, you know it does what I'm not. saying. So, so do you believe that in 2023 that there can be a quote unquote bloodless revolution? I think there can be. I think the nature of the level of political lethargy, which is fast a fancy word for being asleep, pretty much, the level at which the masses are asleep is so bad is that we don't have the cadre that could make it revolutionary enough to make it anything else anyway. Right. You know what I'm saying? There ain't nobody out here talking about, you know, we got the mile mile of the blues. Like, come on, man. I mean, I have a show called the mile mile hour, but it's, you know, again, it's rhetorical. Right. We've got to build the class consciousness through political education. That's the first step. Once you build the class consciousness through political education, then you go to the confrontational stage. Of course, we know once that's done, the state will start repression. When the state the, repression they, they, they'll starts, they'll continue repress. They'll heighten the repression. The heighten the, the they, state. They, they already started repression. Right. right. The repression's always been there. The state yeah. will heighten the repression. When the state heightens the repression, then you start to become more sophisticated in your tactics to evade state repression. And then perhaps you retract from your external confrontation and you become more sophisticated with your confrontation or you retreat into your communities and re do new political education and engage in political fronts of neutralization, creating alternative political parties, voter registration campaigns to neutralize and sabotage political aspirations of certain groups, engaging in unity with other ethnic groups to create political blocks to sabotage middle-class petite bourgeois black political aspirations in certain areas, Cre creating all kinds of allyships with those that you can infiltrate, give political age education to, who are willing to see your vision that you can use to sabotage the overall system. Right on. Right on. So look, let me ask you, um, I, know, I know you wrote a piece um, on uh, black eugenics, right? Yes. How does that fit in 
and 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 break that down for folks because you know I'm sure that you know just on on first glance someone saying black eugenics you know like like what are you talking about you know what I mean that that would right. be the you know let, let's rap about that well tell us about that piece and what do you mean by black eugenics black eugenics uh black eugenics and the title of the piece was black eugenics and how the black misleadership class of the early early 20th century supported ster supported sterilizing the black poor that piece was inspired You're saying, let, let, let's repeat that because of the fact that you know even though they can rewind it i want to make sure that folks are clear what you just said say yeah. that one more time Pastor. black eugenics how the black misleadership class of the early 20th century supported sterilizing the black poor hmm. black eugenics is a piece that i wrote i believe in 2017 as a result of me accessing a phd dissertation of a woman who has subsequently turned that dissertation into a book that you can buy on amazon her name is dr chantella sherman the name of the book is called in search of purity i forgot the rest of the title but the new title Search In Search of Purity and Chantella Sherman, you can get the book. In Search of Purity documents how eugenics, which is a concept that is based on the idea that you can biologically, through selective breeding, breed out weaker and inferior biological human beings of society through strategic breeding, sterilization and certain kind of strategic birth control uh mechanism so you can have a better purer smarter race it is the same type of actual eugenics that was used by the nazis during the holocaust okay as a matter of fact the only reason why it fell out of grace in the united states is because it started to be used by the nazis during the holocaust and they got their model for eugenics from the United States and Britain. Mm. This philosophy was a mainstream American philosophy at the late 19th and early 20th century. It was taught in schools, it was promoted, it was taught at HBCUs. It was so well accepted that the quote unquote first vanguard of what we call the talented 10th, everywhere from Booker T. Washington to Du Bois to, to uh, um, uh, 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 the woman who founded Bethune Cookman College to uh, to Ernest Just to all of these vanguards, Mary McLeod Bethune, all of these vanguards supported various eugenic schemes. Some of these doctors engaged in sterilizing poor black people to literally breed poor, what they call dysgenic black people out of the race because they needed, they hated poor. And the working poor so bad, they wanted to uplift the race by breeding them out the race. This was supported by the National Urban League. Many of them were avid supporters of Margaret Sanger, who people know was a racist advocate of various forms of birth control to depopulate specimens that were poor, not only black, but also white. And it was a virulent, virulent campaign that was also racist, but because there was a, a certain component of what some thought was positive eugenics that could be used to uplift the race. Black elites used it as a means to want to purge themselves of poor and working class black people that they felt were an embarrassment to them. All right. And the Urban League was a major proponent of this politics. And the main reason I wrote that piece is to illustrate that all of these superheroes of Black history that we that we constantly uh, 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 valorize hated poor and working class Black people as much as the Negroes who say things like these niggas who don't pull their put pull up their boot their pants and are sagging need to be locked up today. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite YouTube videos that you can find on YouTube is a video clip of middle-class black people in LA in 1960. I don't know if you've ever seen this video um, talking about the fact that poor folk in 1960 are coming from the South and moving to Los Angeles. 
These bougie Negroes are like, I don't mean to sound like a snob, but I don't want these people coming here. These folks are horrible. I mean, and it, they literally sound like what you would think white people are saying about their own black folk who they despise. Right. Now, if you think these black elites were that bad in 1960, what do you think they were in the early, like in the early 20th century? So now, now you're making some, you know, some hardcore allegations, Pascal. You're talking about uh, uh, Booker T and, and W. E. B. Du Bois, and you're talking you talking about the book that has the citations. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Because because folks are going to look at this, they're going to be like, "This dude, I lost his mind." You know, not Mary we McLeod. Did a, we did two it. shows. Shout out to Jeff Kennedy, who's a friend of mine, who's a specialist in eugenics. We did two shows. Hmm. on our podcast about black eugenics. We had one with the sister who's got a PhD from Morgan Morgan, uh, Morgan uh, State University who did a PhD on eugenics and we did one also uh, with Jeff Kennedy talking about eugenics and black fraternities. Wow. So yeah, if anyone type This is Revolution podcast on YouTube and you see the sources but it's, This is Revolution podcast and eugenics. No doubt. We definitely gonna have to revisit that. Uh, that in particular. So um, with with that in mind, you know, we've, um, you know, transatlantic slave trade. You know, you, you often get folks talking about, you know, Africans were involved in slavery, so on and so forth. You know, and you're talking about, here it is, you're talking about black eugenics, so on and so forth. What's your, um, what's your take on that? When you hear folks talking about, you know, the the black and, and and what would you say the purpose of slavery was? Because of the fact that again, folks uh, like to uh, simplify things just based off of race. Let me let me get some uh, feedback from you. What, what, what would you I say? Mean, I would say number one, I think the purpose of the transatlantic slave trade was to provide a secure labor force for burgeoning uh, capitalism that was developing as a product of the uh, discovery, the quote unquote discovery of the new world by the Europeans, Spain, Portugal, and otherwise, as a consequence of the realization that the Native American population were too physically feeble to engage in that, uh, labor, that labor requirement. If you go to Bartolome Las Casas, who was a Spanish uh, priest in Spain, in, in Hispaniola, as a matter of fact, because the first Africans were actually brought to what is now the island of Haiti and Dominican Republic in 1501, he argued that the he actually pleaded to bring Africans who the Spaniards, don't forget, the Spaniards and the Portuguese had had a seven, seven to 800 year relationship with Africans right before Columbus as a consequence of the Moorish conquest of, of, uh, of uh, the Iberian Peninsula. All right. So they weren't alien to these people. And he basically was like, bring the Africans because they were stronger because we this is too brutal for the Native Americans. So I would argue that the purpose of the transatlantic slave trade was to provide a more stable, durable labor force for the burgeoning mer mercantile capitalism in the plantation economy of the Caribbean and what would become North America due to the inability of the Native population providing that labor force. Okay, so what what do you say to uh because you have these organizations out here, um groups like ADOS, right? And and they talk about reparations, so on and so forth. What would be your uh your 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 thought on that? Because you have certain folks that are running around saying that, you know, only Africans in America should get reparations. What do you say to that? My position is this. My position is that reparations are only going to be good as good as the political coalition you can build to get them number one even if you build that political coalition i always, i always tell people all the time i will never tell people that i don't think you won't get reparations i actually think it's very possible that the american ruling class will give black people reparations the question is this will the american ruling class give black people in america reparations enough to disturb the function of capitalism that requires a redundant surplus labor quotient that has to be housed particularly in prison and has to be racialized largely to maintain the security of the ecosystem of capitalism my answer would be no they will not in other words, race, reparations in a capitalist society will allow certain classes of black people 
and I would argue the top elite tier of black people to receive benefits, but particularly the lumping and the poor who are somewhere over 70%, 75 to 80% of black people will get less to little and they will not only still be reduced to the reserve army of labor and the various iterations of the social harm that come with that, broken families, drugs, crime, etc., but the blowback from the reparations in this political reactionary right-wing climate will cause such a lack of any type of sympathy for the plight of poor and black people that the climate in America will become even more hostile to the condition. So you will have a greater class divide internally amongst black people, while more poor and working class black people will catch worse and worse hell. Uh, so I, I want to, um, along with that, and I appreciate your answer. Um, you know, I, I know that you um, you are a proponent of, of Marxism. Is that correct? I'm not mm-hmm. saying I'm a proponent of Marxism. I use Marxism as a tool to challenge capitalism. Right on. So for, for, for African people, because again, you know, so often you hear folks saying, you know, um, you know, how can Marx and Engels and such help African people? You know, so I, I want to know what's your, um, you know, and I understand what you just said as far as the tool. What's your take on uh, Marx and African people? And, um, you know, if, if you have time, uh, a moment, break down dialectical materialism. Dialectical materialism. First of all, I think that one of the most valuable aspects of Marxist analysis is dialectical or historical materialism. What is that? That's a fancy word. That's a fancy word to say. Look at the economic motivations behind historical actors to understand what drives them and what has driven them to engage in actions, policies, warfare, and conquest. So you can envision how the economic position of various actors may determine how they will react or act or or enact policy in the future. That is the the value of dialectical or historical materialism. And that is the value of a quote unquote Marxist tool of analysis. Right on, right on. I wanna, I wanna, we we we're, we're around the same age, you know. We we grew up. We watched uh, hip hop, and we talked about this uh, off camera. We watched uh, uh, hip hop. Um, you know, we're talking about this being the quote unquote 50 year anniversary. Although you know, we know that this is also the 55th year anniversary mm-hmm. of um, the Last Poets on May 19th. Shout out to the Last Poets um, uh, who are in Brazil right now. Just actually spoke to some of them earlier. Um, they on May 19th, Malcolm X Day, uh, also uh, Yuri Kochiyama and and, uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh's born date, they started, um, uh, that was their first performance. So they'll be celebrating again their 55th year. I want to know for you, these 50 years in hip hop, right? What do you feel that hip hop's role is in society? Is hip hop, can hip hop be used as a tool for liberation or do you believe hip hop's a tool for neo-colonialism? That's a very, very profound question. First of all, as you know, we are from the same age. You know, uh, you know, I grew up in Jamaica, Queens. I had an older cousin who was had been a, a hip hop DJ since like 1979. My younger brother, who's you know 50 years old, was a hip hop DJ. I have another cousin who uh, was also a hip hop DJ. I watched this music and art form get birthed in front of my own eyes. I, like you, are old enough to remember where you could only get hip-hop music on tapes. You wouldn't even hear it on the radio. At best, you could hear it on 92KTU at a certain hour at a certain hour at night. Uh, you remember Video Music Box. We remember all, all of that, you know, going to block parties, et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, my cousin, my cousin, shout out to my cousin Easy Al, who was a DJ back in the day. He used to tell me a story. He's like, man, we used to, DJ at parties at Hollis Park, and this kid, this kid, this kid Jay used to always be 
bothering me to get on the microphone. This kid, you should drive me crazy, man. I was like, who is this kid? Jay, is he always talking about? I was like, man, you don't remember Jay. I was like, who's Jay? He was talking about LL Cool J. I was <laughs> like, are you serious? He was like, yeah, man. I remember when he used to come up to me asking me to get on a microphone because my my, uh, my cousin is, LL Cool J was born the same year as me. He's seven right. years older than I because my, my cousin was from Rochdale, but from uh, Laurelton, and he used to you know go out to, uh, he went to elementary school with Run DMC as well, so he used to go out to uh, Hollis and DJ and do his thing and all that. But as much affection as I have for the music, watching it get birth, get born, because I'm very cynical of the way in which popular culture is used as a social engineering tool for not only black people, but for American people or for people in the world overall. I realize that in a capitalist society, the revolutionary capacity of cultural phenomenon is very easily neutralized because oftentimes the mechanisms of production are quickly overtaken by capitalist or corporate forces that either bastardize that revolution, that revolutionary potential or neutralize it for pure profit. So when Amilcar Cabral, the revolutionary a uh, leader from uh, uh, Guinea-Bissau talks about how using culture for revolution. When Mao talks about using culture revolution, when Che talks about using culture for revolution, they're talking about organic indigenous peasant cultures that have not been bastardized by the capitalist means of production. They're right. talking about indigenous cultures that have been rooted in the lives of people for generations that can be used for revolutionary propaganda at best. Culture at best can be used to serve as revolutionary propaganda. The, 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 it will not create the revolution, all right? It's just a tool of revolutionary propaganda. And my position is that because we live in a capitalist society where the means of production is so are so oftentimes controlled by those who are clearly not interested in seeing revolution that what hip hop has become is a become a more effective tool in the 50 plus year counter revolution since 1968 of neoliberalism which is the economic order that starts in the early 70s that renders to hyper privatization dislocation the functionality of the state unless it helps capital uh massive wealth inequality and destroying state resources. And this is the paradigm. Neoliberalism is a fancy word for the shift of capitalism that happens in the 1970s that turns everything to financialization. And as a result, because hip hop, you don't need bands, you don't need musicians. It allows you to have a high return on investment with low investment on, on actual musical performers. It's the perfect music form for neoliberalism. Not only that, hip hop, because it is a music that comes out of the lumpen proletariat, the urban underclass, it reifies or validates cultural phenomenon of the underclass, but because of the racialization of the black underclass in American history, they will use that reification or validation of underclass cultural phenomenon to engage in what is called underclass ideology, which is a phenomenon that starts in the 70s that says the black underclass is so dysfunctional, no policy, no jobs, nothing can do be done to help them. The only thing that can be done is to lock them up as prison in prison, and that's why we need more mass incarceration. So hip hop literally, if you look at the rhetoric of politicians, becomes a validator of underclass ideology that is used to explain why we need more carceral punishment of poor black and brown communities. I'm not saying that's the fault of hip hop. I'm saying that is the way the music has been used to facilitate ne neoliberal carcerality by the ruling class. And I'm not saying that this is the fault of hip hop. What I'm saying is that this is the fault of the way in which Popular cultural production, particularly Black popular cultural production, is used to neutralize the radical 
potential and political activity of black people. And I would also argue, if you read the Kerner Commission report from 1968, the section on blacks in media, the proliferation of black cultural production that comes about after the urban rebellions from 1967 and 1971, where you had over 300 cities burned to a crisp, was intentionally done to neutralize the radical potentiality of Black urban communities, and hip-hop comes in that space of time. And we, as much as I love disco, soul, you know, good times, soul train, all of those cultural phenomena proliferate as part of that project of radical neutralization. And one thing none of us can deny, regardless of what we think about the Black Power era or the 60s, is that there has never been a political radicalization of the Black poor and working class and masses that has existed again in that period. And that's largely helped by the hyper fetishization of black cultural production that black people are still enamored with to this day. Just look at how the, we reacted to the Oscars. I shouldn't say we, how some black people reacted to the Oscars the other day. Right. So, you know, and, and, and you, you have some valid points, right? So um, I, I wanna, with what you're saying, right? Because again, we we, we both grew up in the tri-state and, and you talked about pretty much, not necessarily the origins of hip hop, but, but that, infancy stage right uh when it was a toddler more or less right so we remember uh you mentioned wktu and you mentioned you know ralph mcdaniels in the box and we remember when hip-hop only came on for a few hours on friday and saturday night friday you was checking out kiss fm with with red alert i think and 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 chuck chill out they was making their uh their joints and i think on on BLS, it was uh, Mr. Magic and I'm trying to think Molly Ma was that on? Uh, yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So, so we we talking about literally a few hours, eight nine o'clock till about midnight. That was hip hop. Now here it is. You can't go anywhere damn near in America and not see or hear some form of hip hop. For you, what do you think? Because you talk about how it, it it's uh currently being used as a tool in, in, in its art form, right? Mm -hmm. When did you think, when do you, when would you say that began? Because of course, again, you know, we remember the the quote unquote golden era and the, the, the conscious hip hop era. We remember when, you know, public enemy, you're in New York and you can hear public enemy blasting through the stereos, you know, the car stereos, the drug dealers, whoever, the stick up kids, everybody listened to Public Enemy. Everybody was listening to X Clan. Everybody was listening to Queen Latifah. Everybody was listening to, you know, uh, 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 the Jungle Brothers and all these other Absolutely. artists. Absolutely. Right. When did this transformation in your eyes take place? Because Def Jam and all of that was already in full effect. In fact, I'm, I'm well aware. Uh, Rush Associated Labels at one point probably managed a good over a hundred different artists in hip hop. So when would you say this, 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 uh, transformation took place? I will say, uh, starting with the embrace of Coke rap and gangster rap in the late eighties and early nineties, when, because we have to understand what happens, right? You have, when NWA comes out in 87 with, uh, straight out Compton, right? Right. That album, is is as much as people and I love that album. I love that song. No doubt. No that doubt. was a counter revolutionary album. Hmm. So, so you, you 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 would say it was totally counter revolutionary. I mean, I'm not saying it was totally. What I'm saying it was counter revolutionary yeah. in the face of what were the competing musical elements that were being produced at the time, like what was coming out of KRS One, was coming out of Public Enemy. What I'm saying right. is that even though, yeah, you know, After Police is great. That's not the salient message that comes out of NWA. A lot of that whole kind of like, when you have people talking about, you know, self-destruction, stop and stop gang violence. And then you have cats talking about, you know, N-words with attitude, celebrating the fact that, you know, you know they have, you know, the gangs around them and the hyper misogyny and all that other stuff. It takes the music in a certain way. Like, maybe it's unfair to say it's a counter-revolutionary because uh, I, I would assume that the other stuff was revolutionary, so that's unfair. Right. <clears throat> I think it was a counterproductive move in the aggregate because it starts the trend 
of the gangsterization of the music. And we know that the first hip hop gangster song was PSK. It doesn't start. Right. I mean, the gangster rap starts before that, right? So right. We, we are aware of that. But what I'm saying is that the popularization of gangsterism, and when I'm going to make it very succinct, this stops when crime becomes an aesthetic of hip hop music. Okay. That was not the case in 79. That was not the case in 77. That was not the case in 81. That was not the case in 82. That was not the case in 83, 84, 85. By late 87 to the early 90s and on into the 90s, crime becomes an aesthetic of hip hop. Okay. So what what would you say to like uh because um correct me if I'm wrong you had groups like Two Live Crew who came out before NWA. Yeah, but they were, I mean, they were like, Two Live Crew is basically Florida-based version of Braggadocio. Right. So, so uh, right. But but at the same time, of course, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just playing Cracker's Advocate here. I'm saying, like, you know, we, we look at, um, you know, the, 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 the situation they had with... Um, with uh, uh, you know, going to Supreme Court, so on and so forth, yeah, in regards I mean, to that. I, you know, I mean, they, you know, they had great bass music, but yeah, you know, they had obviously some problematic, problematic images, but they were doing nothing. I mean, you look at some of the stuff that were coming out of Slick Rick, Dougie Fresh. They were right. just Florida, Miami based braggadocio. That particular version. Yeah, and I don't think Two Live. I would not make the argument that Two Live Crew as a band. Had crime as an aesthetic of the. Oh no 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 no! I, now I, I wasn't saying I wasn't saying it's crime. I was just saying just the whole turn of, um, you know, like like the uh, if we're talking about sex in that whole program. Yeah, I mean, that, but they did. I mean, that that exists even before them, man. Right, you know, right, right, Rick, right, right. You know, you know, tr- slick Rick treat him like a prostitute. Yeah, you, you 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 got a point there, but that was '88, man. Stop playing, but. They, <laughs> <laughs> but now nah, I, I got you. I, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm you know, j- just getting your take on that, because also when folks talk about uh, N.W.A., it seems like a lot of folks forgot about the movie Colors. And for, for us on the East Coast, I would argue that, you know. The, the, the whole I don't even know how much of an impact N.W.A. would have made on many of us. Had we not saw the movie Colors, because I think to me that was a culture shock for folks on the East Coast, because although we had, you know, you had your versions of street organizations, gangs, quote unquote, you know, decepts and things of that nature. It it wasn't to, you know, it wasn't about no colors. You didn't know that based on, you know, okay, you wearing this color, they're wearing that color, you know, so on and so forth. But to me, it seemed like that was like a a serious um, eye opener. And awakening for us, brother. I remember when Colors and NWA came out, and I literally remember cats in New York saying, "I didn't even know they had black people in California." Right, and and then with the palm trees, with us, we was like growing up in the bricks because we grew up in high rises, pissy project hallways, and you know what I'm saying, and and and, and dope needles, and 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 blood and crime and so on and so forth. We thought they was out there damn mind. It's like these motherfuckers got palm trees. Why are you angry? You know what I'm saying? We we couldn't even understand that shit. Like, you know, and it, it took a while, I'm gonna be honest and not to get off track. But I remember going out to uh to, to LA in the middle of the East Coast, West Coast beef. And I'm out there with my New York Yankee cap on. And and I remember this sister was like, Well, you know, this is a you know, it's a blood neighborhood, so on and so forth. I was like, man, whatever. But I remember going on uh she took me to uh some shop and it was like crazy busy street or whatever. I forget what street it was. But I saw a cat get carjacked at 3 p.m. on this broad ass. <laughs> I'm talking about it's like it's looking like you on Broadway in New York. And cat just pull out like a few steps away. Jack dude, he had a Jerry curls. I wasn't respecting him because these cats were still wearing Jerry curls, perms, and whatnot. This is the 90s. I'm like. You know, before that, I'm like, man, what, what I look like being scared of a nigga with a Jerry curl. But they made a believer, you know what I'm saying? Because of the fact that 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 helped me to understand that that um, you know, in the more the words of Rock Kim, it's not where you're from, it's where you it ain't where you from, it's where you at. 
And where you at is mentally. You can be on any, any place on the planet. If, if your politics aren't in order, if you're impoverished, if you're hungry, so on and so forth. Um, if you're in the right elements or the wrong elements, it can dictate your reality. You know, so um, definitely appreciate uh, your take on that. What what do you have coming down the pike? I'm going to definitely, uh, definitely look forward to inviting you back on the show because there's a number of different things that we didn't tap into. But I think that, uh, you know, we, we, we gave the folks um, something to work with. What are some of the things, you know, This Is Revolution and, and some of the other things that you have coming up? I'm glad you asked that. Please check out This Is Revolution podcast on all your relevant podcast apps. Go on YouTube, type This Is Revolution podcast, like and subscribe our page. Go to our Patreon page and support us monthly, $5, $3, $30 a month. This Is Revolution podcast is on Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Saturdays at noon. We have a new show on Wednesdays. We call it White Guy Wednesdays with some of our uh, white comrades who give their radical analysis on phenomenon. The last Wednesday of every month, I have my show on this revolution called the Mau Mau Hour. So this last Wednesday of March, please come check out my show, the Mau Mau Hour. I have not yet determined what the subject matter will be. I'm working on a piece talking about more about class and black politics. You can find my work at Black Agenda Report. Just Google my name at Black Agenda Report, Pascal Robert, Huffington Post, Pascal Robert. You can, I have two articles up at Newsweek. I need to produce more. Uh, I'll just Google, Google my name and you'll see some of my work. You can see some of you'll see all work at the, the Real News Network as well. And uh, I have several interviews on Haiti and Haitian history. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you have Sirius XM Radio, tomorrow at 11 a.m., uh, I will be appearing on Dr. Wilma Leon's show on Channel 126 on 11 a.m. on Sirius XM Radio. I pre-recorded an interview with him talking about some foreign policy. And uh, April, we're going to have some interesting shows ahead coming on This Is Revolution podcast with my host, Jason Miles, and I'm the co-host. So we might have to invite you on as well. But uh, that's oh, pretty man. much what the immediate agenda is for the near future. Hey, man, that's how I know you're a professional, man. You should get some classes to some of these dudes on this platform. You know what I'm saying? You you ask what's going on. You got the full rundown. You know what I mean? They, we got cats. I ain't saying no names. They just totally forget what platform they are. They talk about, you know, uh, uh, bells, whistles, dog biscuits, and, 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 you know, totally forget. Man, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, Pascal Robert, I, I want to um, tell the audience and whatnot. He's going to tell, he, before we got on, you gonna tell me that his last name is Robert and not Robert? Like I'm gonna be confused. You know what <laughs> I'm saying? Like what what kind of African would I be? But anyway, I definitely appreciate you uh, you coming on. Looking forward to uh, uh, collaborating in the future and um, you know chatting it up, building and uh, stay on top of the uh, on top of your game, man. And uh, you know we are gonna win in spite of ourselves. All right, brother. I appreciate that. No doubt, man. You're checking out RSTV. That was Pascal Robert. Um, check him out on all his platforms. Uh, be advised that we have a ton of things coming up over the next week. Check out um, Gorilla Intellectual um, uh, University. We'll be airing on Monday uh, from 8 a.m. EST to 10 a.m. EST. Uh, of course, the morning show, the remix morning show, we're back in effect Tuesday through Thursday. Um, uh, there's a few different riot starters that will be coming up. We'll have... Uh, your guy Diallo Kenyatta on. Uh, I'm doing a piece, actually doing a series called Who the Fuck Is. So I have a uh, piece called Who the Fuck Is Diallo coming up uh, this Tuesday at uh, 7 p.m. EST. We appreciate you all. Make sure you subscribe, like, and follow Black Power Media. Um, share it with your folks, share it with your comrades, share this episode and stay on point. You know what it is around here. We're going to win. Um, and, and this is what it's all about. You're checking out RSTV. And as always, it's war without terms. Peace. <laughs>